Okay, uh, should I start? Uh, uh, for the benefit of the online viewers, uh, good afternoon. My name is John Pavlakis, and I'm the chairman of the geotechnical division. And it's my great to, to um, invite or to to welcome you here at, at Ambrosia Hall for this our third evening lecture for the year. Um, I've run the toilets uh, locations to everybody here, so I won't do that again. Um, to those of you who've come in person, thank you very much. We really appreciate it and we're grateful for your your presence. It must be really um, uh, it must be a great thing to be able to come out again after two years of COVID restrictions and not having to wear masks and to be able to network again. I know I'm very excited to be able to come out like this. Uh, to those of you online, um, I thank you very much for joining us. I'm always amazed at how many of you join our evening lectures. Today we've got I think up to 135 participants online, which is quite incredible. Thank you very much. And uh, for interest sake, if you can maybe drop in the comment section where you where you're situated at the moment, which city or which country, um, so we can know where you're tuning in from. But thank you for joining us. So uh, I'm sure everybody's really looking forward to Andrew starting his lecture. If you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I have some news to share and some announcements. From the Division. Um, the, it, some of you may already be aware that the was awarded the Outstanding Member Award from the ISMGE, the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering, and it was presented at the conference in Sydney um, in May earlier this year. This award acknowledges the achievements and the exceptional work done by the Geotechnical Division, increasing the membership base and their contributions to. Uh, technical input provided by its members to the ISSMGE and the geotechnical community as a whole. This includes conferences, workshops run by the geotechnical division, recognition of our members through our various awards, um, the geotechnical division's involvement in the technical committees, writing and maintaining of local codes and codes of practices, as well as um, extensive contributions to international journals. So. I would like the opportunity to congratulate and thank the previous chairman and committee members who, with their guidance and hard work and dedication to the division, um, as well as the significant contributions made by you, our members, made this award possible. It's a very prestigious award, and uh, we're all very proud of the division, and it really is something exceptional. And if we can all give the previous committees an, um, a, a, a a round of applause. Congratulations, everybody, and I hope we can uh, take this further and repeat in a couple of years. In the light of this, I'd like to invite those of you that are not involved with the division yet or would like to become involved with the technical committees to so please contact us. We'd like to continue the exemplary work that's been done over the last five or six years and um, maintain the impact that we have on our geotechnical community. Um, I would also like to highlight, if you'd like to get involved, we, we've initiated the Time Capsule Project, which uh, is intended to capture the last 100 years of geotechnical history in South Africa. Uh, and I encourage you to visit, visit our website. Please share your successes, your achievements, see what everybody else is doing. It's a blog site and uh, it's open for communication, so you guys can chat and try to get um, information flowing. It'll, it can only help our future engineers and the, our community. And finally, on behalf of SICE, I'd like to ask our members if they can um, start nominating or consider nominating people for fellows, or honorary fellows for SICE. Uh, fellows need to be 36 years or older and have achieved significant re recognition in the industry. And honorary fellows would need to be provided, need to have provided significant service to SICE or the civil engineering community as a whole. So, but sorry, the deadlines for that are the 10th of August and the nomination forms would be in our newsletters or directly from the SICE website. So moving on to this evening's proceedings, big thank you to our sponsor tonight, our main sponsor being Nike Fusold. Thank you very much. And our general sponsor, SRK, for sponsoring this event and the drinks and snacks that we're going to be having and enjoying tonight after the lecture. Thank you to Masain for organizing and prepping this event. I know it hasn't been 100% flawless, but it's perfect. Thank you. 
And to Andrew, thank you very much again for taking the time and preparing and presenting this lecture tonight. I'm sure everybody's really looking forward to it. And I'll hand over to Marsen. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Just a couple of logistics things. Um, John already mentioned where the bathrooms are. Uh, load shedding starts at six. The generator takes about 30 seconds to kick in, so just bear with us for, for that little bit. Uh, the attendance registers for the guys online, you don't need to do anything. Uh, the Teams webinar does it yourself, so don't worry, but for the in-person uh, attendees, please the attendance registers out front, just fill it in before you leave. The lecture will be recorded and posted on the Judith uh, YouTube page, so you can go watch it later if you'd like. Um, the, and then just on the Q&A portion, we'll take a couple of questions from the floor, and then we'll also take some questions online for the people attending online. If you'd like to ask a question, just raise your hand online and we will unmute you and then you can ask a question verbally to, to Andrew. But then I'd just like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Andrew Copeland is the director of KPSA and the technical director mining of, of KP Africa at Knight Pisalt, Knight Pisalt's head office in Santon. He oversees business development and technical aspects of the mine residue to technical hydrogeology, geology, and environmental work undertaken by KP. He has had extensive exposure to the international mining industry and to the full chain of mining activities and project stages. With that introduction, John, uh, Andrew, I'll hand over to you. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks to SICE for this invitation. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this and to give you a preview. We call it a preview with regard to the content of the new SANS code because it hasn't been finalized yet. Um, it's at the stage where it's still with SANS and it's still being reviewed by them, um, but it's at an advanced stage. So I think uh, as an industry, we really are looking forward to getting this out. And I'm sure you've probably picked up the gist of some of the content, but tonight's an opportunity to give you a little bit more detail as to what's, what's gone into this and how we put it together. It's been a bit of a, a collaboration between SIC and SAIMM, and we thank very much SIC uh, for a lot of the industry um, inputs in terms of the consulting fraternity, but SAIMM has come and provided us with some funding. And the reason we asked for some funding was to try and speed up the process and give it a bit of impetus, because there's nothing worse than working on something voluntarily for a long period of time. And uh, so getting paid for some of the work has, has certainly helped uh, push that along a little bit. So in terms of the outline of this um, presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we needed to update the SANS code. I'm going to talk a little bit about the drafting team and the timelines associated with that. And uh, also the alignment between SANS and the GISTN. That's going to be the main focus of the, uh, the talk this evening. And then I'm going to just focus on some of the key changes and challenges. What are the changes and how do they impact on, on what we're doing? Is it a big change um, and what are those differences? And lastly, just end off with what is the way forward? And uh, hopefully that gives you a big picture. So in terms of an introduction, then uh, SANS was actually a really, really good document. If you measure it up against other codes, be it Canadian, be it Australian, it stood up really, really well. So why do we need to update it? It has unfortunately become updated in certain areas, and you'll see when I, I talk about that, um, that there are some things that we need to become a little bit more rigorous around, and uh, it's been broadened because there's more to tailings than just the technical aspects. There's been major failures that have definitely impacted on, on the code. Remember that right back in 1974, there was the Bafeking failure and that triggered the development of the Chamber of Mines guidelines. In 1994 in South Africa, we had the Mary Strait failure and that triggered the current document that we have. But since then, there's been the failures in Canada in 2014, and the two massive failures in Brazil, and that's really what's changed the industry. And there's a lot of, you know, sort of legacy thinking around why is tailings done this this way, 
in the industry and why haven't you cleaned up your act? And there have been too many failures and, and the consequences clearly were just uh, unacceptable. So the mining industry needed to do something. We're building larger TSFs. It's greater risk. There's more and more people associated and close to those tailing facilities, so we can't just keep the status quo. And the other thing was that these failures happened in developed jurisdictions. They had guidelines. We had guidelines. So it, it's it's not just enough to have good guidelines and good standards. Uh, it's got to be more than that. So the mining industry has a legacy, and clearly that relates to um, environmental and social impact. And and clearly in Brazil there was a loss of life, and uh, that's that's something that uh, we we in South Africa are particularly cautious about at the moment. We we have communities downstream of an, a number of tailings facilities, and we need to be cautious about that. There's all technology. And there haven't been many changes. If you think about our upstream dams here, the paddocking system, it really is tried and tested, but you know it's got its issues. And we need to think about what can be done differently, what can be done done better. There's a tolerance, a lower tolerance of risk now, particularly from investors and insurers, and they are what is driving this change. And uh, they're the ones who, you know, look at the. Uh, where they're going to put their money um, in terms of investment into predominantly those listed companies. So the mining industry needs to change and needs to lead this. So I've mentioned failures. There's no doubt that you'll remember this particular video. And um, this was a shocking video, but it, it gave us so much to think about. The visuals that came out of this video said, this can, and it can happen so suddenly, even though they had cameras and videos in place, it wasn't enough. It was too late. This happened with that brittle um, contractive failure, uh, and, and nobody could see it coming. They knew there were signs, but this was a real, real wake-up call for the industry. Of course, there was the uh, Fandao Samarco failure in Brazil, another upstream dam. We've had our own failures in South Africa, and this particular one didn't really reach the press, but in 1993 at Cyplos, there was a failure there. High rates of rise, rainfall, that combination resulted in a large slough in three particular places over three days. They were three separate events. They didn't happen at the same time. It was an example of static liquefaction. And just down the road, a year later, in Mary's break, we all know about this particular failure. And unfortunately, there was a loss of life. Um, and this was the wake up call for South Africa to, to do more. And obviously, the, uh, the SANS code came out of this. So just in terms of the uh, tailing subcommittee so put together uh, to draft this standard, there were two representatives from the mining houses. There were 11 representatives from the consultants, the sort of specialists who are doing the day-to-day the -day design work. And it also included some environmental and social input, just to make sure that we're covering those areas um, of the inputs. There was one representative from an operating contractor. There were two from academia, uh, two from the Minerals Council of South Africa, and three part-time representatives from the uh, SAIMM and, and SICE and SANS themselves, uh, just overseeing the process, but not full-time involved. We unfortunately did not manage to get inputs and uh, representatives from, from government in terms of the Department of Minerals and Energy, uh, DWS, and the Department of Environmental Affairs. We did invite them, um, but we did not get a response on all representatives. So that's unfortunate that so far we have not had that input into the process. Um, and there's still an opportunity for that to happen, but in the comment phase of, of the document. The Water Research Commission and the Council for Geoscience are possibly other um, stakeholders. And of course, there will be NGOs or lobby groups that uh, will also want to, to see what we are doing and whether we're doing the right thing with upgrading this uh, 
uh, document. Just to give you an outline on, on the timing around this document, we started a year ago in uh, February 2021, putting together the draft, deciding how we were going to do it, what the content was going to be, and who was going to write the different chapters. And we got to a point where in January this year, we actually had a, a consolidated draft, and then we sat down and we had a workshop to, to work through it and make sure that it did uh, make sense and that uh, the key points, the, the contentious issues and things like that were dealt with. And then at the end of March, we had tweaked it and updated it and we gave it over to SANS and it's now in the SANS process of being uh, checked. They have a technical committee and on the 10th of July, we're told that those comments will be closed. So that's Sunday, end of this week. Why they chose a Sunday, I'm not sure, but uh, that's the end of their process in terms of comments. We will then be fed back those comments and based on that, we will then see what updates we need to do. And uh, hopefully at the end of July, we go into a public comment phase and we issue that for comment to the industry, um, whoever uh, needs to see that. So SANS will, will, will follow through on that process. And the intention is that by October this year, uh, we, will, we will launch the final document. Um, this is all subject to to change. It's all subject to, you know, whatever might might take place in the next couple of months. But I'm optimistic that uh, at least by the end of this year, we we will be out with with this document. And it looks like there's really good interest from not only the uh, attendance here but also online. So I think you're all anticipating this and and looking forward to working with the new document especially as some of the draft documents of, of the SANS in 2008 and 2013 didn't get properly published, they remained as draft. It's so important that this one does become the official document. So I've mentioned some of the uh, key stakeholders, but linked to the stakeholders is the legislation. So whenever you update a document like this, we have to comply with the regulations. So We've not ignored that at all. That is part of, of the document, whether it's uh, the regulations related to the Department of Environmental Affairs, NEMA, NEMWA, and so on. Everything related to environmental impact assessments and EMPRs, closure provisions, and that it has to align with, with the regulations there. And the same for the DMRE and the MPRDA and the uh, Mine Health and Safety Act. We have to recognize that those have to be part of this. Same with Water Affairs and the National Water Act and the associated licensing um, and also the Dam Safety Office. It's all got to be uh, linked to this. And there's possibly other acts that uh, we need to um, take into account. And we've, we've not specifically um, consulted with the National uh, Nuclear Regulator, for example. But that, in terms of radiation, that has to be covered as well. So, of course, the mining industry, the mining companies, the unions, Minerals Council, they will ultimately all um, provide comment on this, and uh, they, they will have to be the ones that accept it as well. In the document itself, we have not put references to any legislation for the simple reason that it can change. So the onus will be on, on yourselves as, as the industry, as the executors of, of, of the, um, the outputs of the code, is to, to make sure that you're aligned with what, what, the, what the legislation says um, and, and comply with that. And so in the previous SANS code, there was a full list of legislation, and unfortunately, over time that becomes outdated and there's new legislation and there's changes and that gets outdated. So we've not tried to to link to that other than to say comply with the latest. So what we did do with the document is we said we're probably going to have to head in the direction of looking at the GISTM as the as the template to follow. The reason being that 
it's now basically the, the global standard. And if we try and do anything different, we're going to be counterproductive. So we all know that those major failures were why the GIS team was, was, was written. The investors were particularly uh, wanting to make a change, make, make that changes. And the, the same with the insurance companies. UNEP got involved um, and were quite a powerful influence in the drafting of that document. And ICMM drove that process. There were, we could have looked at um, other regulations or, or, or standards like ICOLD, uh, the CDA and ANCOLD. We certainly have taken that into account. But remember, this is more of a standard than, than a guideline. So those other documents still behave as guidelines and really good documents to consider. So back in 2016, um, the ICMM put out a, a position statement on the tailings government governance framework. And then subsequently in 2020, they uh, issued the standard together with guidelines and protocol. And you've probably all seen those, those documents. Uh, they've been around a while and they've set the, the dates for when certain facilities, depending on their consequence classification, have to comply with uh, the GISTM requirements. It looks like there's been good acceptance of that document and many non-ICMM uh, mining companies have actually uh, decided to, to follow it and to try and comply to it. So just a recap on the GISTM itself. It was the ICMM who put that together as together with the Tailings Advisory Group the principles for responsible investment, the PRI, um, they they were the other big driver. And of course, UNEP, United Nations Environmental uh, Policy Group. And as a result of that, they came up with a consequence classification system that was going to drive the sort of the requirements for each level of, of, of classification. Um, they wanted to make sure that there was a lot of review involved in, in the design work of tailings facilities. Emergency preparedness planning had to be properly taken into account and there needed to be proper accountability and that whole governance structure that uh, is part of the GISTM. So yeah, um, I've kind of touched quite a bit already on why we want to align with the GISTM because SANS was a good document. And so what we did is we, we took the good parts of SANS and we've incorporated that into the document. And it's also a matter of, can we accept a lower standard? If this is the way the industry is moving internationally, can we stay with the old SANS? And the decision was no. We don't want tailings failures in South Africa, so we have to move with the times and upstream dams are high risk. We know that. It's not to say we can't do upstream dams, but uh, do we really understand um, that whether we're managing our risk correctly? Investors and insurers may ignore SANS. So if we try to stay with the old SANS document, they might just say, we, we're not going to invest in this mining company or, or whatever it is. And they may not insure you as, as a mining company. And it could cost the mining industry more to adopt these changes because it's a higher standard um, and it may affect jobs. But I think there's, there's this balance between doing things right as opposed to uh, things costing a bit more. Ultimately, we've got to also look at a lot of us are, are in that profession where if something goes wrong, we become the jailable offender. And we don't want to go to jail. We don't want to stand up in, in front of a judge and say, I used a lesser standard, Mr. Judge. Is that OK? Of course, he's not going to accept that when there's good, there's better um, guidance and standards out there. So we're in that situation where we were almost put under pressure to adopt the GISTM as the way to go forward. There was also this thinking around in the standard, do we consider upstream dams as being banned like they've done in Brazil? Uh, no more hydraulic de deposition of tailings. We did not take that approach, but we had to consider that. And it certainly 
right up front we've put in there that you must consider options and that's typically the practice across the world make sure you you're not just designing the old way because it's the cheapest and there are a number of lobby groups out there at the moment that are saying to us upstream tailings facilities you know are high risk you need to stop doing that you need to change over to to dry stacking and, and filtering and things like that and we're not quite there yet as a country and we didn't feel we, we could impose that so we stopped short of that but that pressure is still out there and there are some mining companies that are starting to move in that direction themselves on new projects to say we're only going to go dry stacking because that's what the investors and insurance are looking for so we did stop short of that um, and I think uh, we've got to, as, as an industry, make sure that, uh, that that still means we have safe and acceptable facilities. So in terms of the new document, what does its structure look like? The old document had aims, principles and requirements. That was the essentially the way it was, was drafted. And so what we've done is we've retained the aims because the aims are still valid. There was nothing wrong with, with those. In terms of the principles, what we did is we took on the, the principles. There were 15 principles in GIS 10. We took on all 15 of those principles. And then we added to that the relevant portion of the old SANS text that still applies and is still relevant. In terms of the requirements and the, the 77 requirements, we did the same thing. So all 77 requirements are in the new document. And then what we've done is we've added to that any short explanation, if required, and not in, not in some cases, there's no extra explanation required. We've just added in where there's South African context that needs to be, be considered. As I said, we, we did not include the legislation. You just must just comply with that. In terms of guidelines and appendices, the old appendices have been taken out. So there was guidance. There was some good guidance information in the old document. You're still welcome to use it, but there's a whole range of guidelines, international guidelines that we can use. So we felt that there was no point in putting in some of those those old appendices. What we did include was a full glossary with all the new terms in there because the GISDM came with a whole lot of new terms and we'll touch on some of those. So old and new terms are in the full glossary. Okay, thanks for that break. I needed needed a drink. <clears throat> so what I've done here is just giving you a little bit of a, a very brief outline of what was in the table of contents of the old document and the new document. And what you'll see there is I've colored things in such a way that you can see how they are covered in the old and the new. So those first four chapters of the uh, of the old are largely covered in, in the sense that uh, there's an introduction section in terms of the overall aims in the new in the new one. The legal framework is covered, but it's not covered in any any detail. Then in terms of management, both documents include management. The new one includes just a whole lot more on the governance, but it was there in the old document. Safety and environmental classification is in both, but now it's updated to to the the more detailed consequence classification that uh, that we need to now look at. Then in terms of the whole design component in green, it's covered in one chapter in the new document, whereas before it was split up into a number of different sections. It's all covered. It's just the way it's covered is, is just slightly different. The aspects that are colored in yellow were not particularly well covered in the old document. The affected communities, the integrated knowledge base, and then public disclosure and access to information is now 
all new. And so we've incorporated that um, and put in the, the relevant guidance associated with that. So that the, it's the yellow areas which are quite different from what was in the old document. Oh, sorry, just to go back. I haven't left out the emergency response and long term recovery item. It was in the old document. Um, it's just much more detailed in terms of the new requirements. OK, so now I'm going to go into. What are the key changes? What are the key requirements that are different? And those of you who have been working with GIS will be quite familiar with these already. The whole area of affected communities. And this relates to consultation. And this is normally done with your social and environmental impact assessments. So in our context, they were being done in the past and there was the public um, consultations being done. But what wasn't happening was that communities would move into the areas of your facilities and now your affected communities change and they still have a say, even though they weren't there when you you um, built the facility or designed it in the first place. And so it's consequence classification changes and you've got to keep consulting with those communities a lot more than you ever had to in the past. Previously, those communities were just sort of almost told you must accept that there's a tailing facility upstream of you. Not anymore. It's, the onus is, is on the industry to make sure that uh, they understand where they're living, what the consequences are, and anything to do with emergency preparedness or evacuation. So, yeah, all downstream um, persons or infrastructure, we need to, to consider that. And obviously, by means of dam break assessments and so on, we, we, we're able to, uh, to do that. So that, that whole community is affected communities um, is now brought into, into the new document. In terms of governance, there was quite a lot of governance in the old document. We, we um, basically said what, what needed to happen in terms of the mine, what their responsibilities were, what needed to happen in terms of the consultant, and then what needed to happen in terms of the operating contractor, what their different roles and responsibilities are. It's now just a little bit more onerous and defined in terms of uh, the, new, the new code. And you'll see these abbreviations here, the accountable executive, the engineer of record, the responsible tailings facility engineer, and the operator. We have adopted the GISTM nomenclature. There's no point in us having mixed terms. We've got to be consistent, otherwise it's going to lead to confusion. Um, and I think you'll notice already that uh, the engineer of record type term is taken off. People are, are accepting it, they understand it, or maybe they don't always understand it, but they they uh, recognize the term and the need for, for such a role. Um, in terms of governments, governance, there's also a lot more emphasis now on making sure that there's adequate training and you've got the right resources. And that means that somebody like a plant manager who may be then responsible for their tailings facility has the right support or the right training. And can the plant manager be the RTFE, the responsible tailings engineer? So all of that needs to be, be carefully thought about. And it's it, we are short staffed. We, we haven't got enough skills in the country for the mining industry to have the full complement of skills and the consulting industry and the operators, uh, it's it's stretching us. So it does need more people, more budgets, and it, GISTM is quite clear about the fact that there should be much less interference in the procurement process. You need to choose the right technical people, regardless of cost. That's that's what GISTM says. Uh, obviously, that doesn't mean that um, anybody abuses the system, but we need to do the right work at the right value and make sure that the job is done correctly. So that's that's the emphasis there. Obviously, in terms of government governance, there's a lot more in terms of reporting, dashboards, reviews, dam safety reviews as well. There's almost a double level of review that's come in. And uh, we're getting used to it. We get reviewed for work we do, you get reviewed for work you do. 
And there's a constructive process here, but it's the checks and balances that if we get that right, we as an industry will do things better. And I, I think we must acknowledge that and we must see it as a, as a positive process. And we can learn from one another. I think that's another aspect. So the last point in, in, in this slide is then the public disclosure. We are required now, or the mining companies in particular, to give access to information. And there's all sorts of questions now around what to disclose. And so I've put a little slide here because it's one of those sort of contentious areas for the mining industry is what do they disclose? They should disclose that people are appointed in terms of the management. They must make sure that they say the operation is being properly managed and there's a monitoring system in place. They should say that there's various reports and uh, site visits that happen on a regular basis. They don't have to give the details, but they must say that the design has been done adequately. They must also say that the stability is in good condition or whatever it is, that it's being analysed um, and give an idea of the frequency to which that's being done. Risk assessments, they need to state that that's up to date um, and that actions are being dealt with. If they don't, if they don't give that kind of positive feedback, what are the public going to think about? And, and so this is this is where it's moving. There needs to be regular community consultation. Emergency response plans need to be um, in place. And you need to communicate that and make sure that public perceptions are being managed, that the zone of influence is understood. And this is where it becomes tricky. As soon as you share a zone of influence, you can get send the wrong message. So it's got to be very carefully handled um, as to what you disclose and how you disclose it. Of course, you need to say that there's environmental monitoring in place. And uh, last but not least, closure. We're not very good at closing tailings facilities, and we're also not particularly good about what the final land uses are either. Integrated knowledge base, I think this is fairly straightforward. It basically says there should be good records for the facilities. And if you don't have an original design report, have a continuation report. <laughs> All those studies need to be kept somewhere, properly filed. Your licenses and conditions, you need to know where they are and, and have them accessible in one, one sort of deposit. You need to have shown that you've considered alternatives and those kind of things. Um, monitoring data is a big, big area. Um, that needs to be managed and centralised and likewise closure plans. In terms of consequence classification and the associated design criteria, this is quite a big change. Dam breach assessments. This is an evolving area. There's complex modelling involved here. We're dealing with mud and water. They don't behave the same, but ultimately if you have a failure, how do they exit that facility? And what are the credible failure modes? And there's a whole sort of discussion around that. You need to have that with, with each facility. Does it fail as a result of overtopping? Is that a credible failure mode? Is it as a result of a slope failure? Is it a result of some kind of erosion by the pipe burst or whatever it is? Um, and then how do you then present the time of arrival, the depth of flow and all those kind of good things in order to inform your emergency response plan? What storm events do you need to look at? And we, I'll come to this in a little bit more detail. Um, so table two in the GISDM particularly talks to the, the storm events that you need to consider. And ultimately the output from this is your zone of inundation. We used to call it the zone of influence. So again, we've shifted to using the, the GISDM term of zone of inundation. Um, and then that will indicate your evacuation zone and alarm systems if you need them. So you would have seen, and this is not a, an easy um, table to look at, but table one is the consequence classification matrix. And if I 
just put some bigger numbers in there so that it's a little bit more legible. It's basically saying on the left hand side is your consequence low, significant, high, very high and extreme. And the way that's classified is based on a population at risk. That's the next cost column, the PAR. The PLL is the potential loss of life. And there's the numbers to describe it. And then equally, there's an environmental column, a health and uh, social and cultural column, and then the infrastructure and economics column. And they may define your consequence classification differently. Um, and that ultimately, the worst case of one of those blocks will define your consequence classification. So you need to go through that. Um, and that needs to be informed by your dam breach. In addition to that, there are these tables, table two and three for the flood design criteria and the seismic design criteria. So we've accepted and adopted these tables. To do anything different would be difficult. The big question here is some of these events are way outside the records that we've got. If we've got a 50 year or even a 100 year record of, of rainfall or even seismic activity, how do you extrapolate that to the one in 10,000? We don't necessarily have good data in many areas for 50 years, let alone 100 years. And what happens is that you get this extrapolation where you may get a, a range as you get up towards the uh, one in 10,000 year event. And is it this number? Or is it this number that you apply? And so that there's, there, there is a gray area in terms of how we do this. And I think that will evolve with time and it'll get better and better with time. But it's probably something that you also need to talk to your, your clients about and vice versa that the mining companies to talk to their, their consultants about is what value do you use? So yeah, just in terms of uh, seismicity and earthquake events the previous document didn't really say too much about seismic events partly because in this part of the world it's generally considered low seismicity but i think you you're noticing now that those one in ten thousand year events start to play a role in whether your facility may or may not be safe under certain conditions so we have to consider it more carefully and that may require some form of seismic hazard assessment and not just a, a desktop exercise. Stability of analyses. Previously, there was no reference to a factor of safety in the SANS code or in the GISTM code. And so what we've done is we've actually put in some guideline, guidance on the factors of safety. And we've linked that to what Anne Cold and iCold recommend. It's guidance in that sense, but I think it's it's become good practice uh, to 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 work with those numbers, and I'll come to the numbers now. Much more specific now about doing drained, undrained, and uh, seismic analyses, and we all know about this whole issue related to whether you use peak strengths, whether you use residual strengths, and how that might behave under certain con contractive or brittle behavior type modes, and we need to understand that better. And that's a direct uh, result of the GISDM saying you must get to grips with that. And what we have also put into this is the 10 rules of upstream tailing facilities. We put it into the new document because it's such good guidance. We've got so many upstream dams, we need to give that guidance. So we felt that was important to be added. And that little diagram there is, is related to you need to have that prism, that wall zone that is withholding anything inside the dam that may be unstable. That wall zone for upstream dams must be non-liquifiable in, in simple terms. So the design, construction, operation, and monitoring of tailings facilities, topic three within the GISTM and principle four, and then requirement 4.6 says we've got to assess this brittle mode of failure um, with conservative design criteria independent of trigger mechanisms to minimize the impact on the performance of the tailings facility. And this is quite a contentious thing because takes quite a lot of testing 
quite a lot of time to get into this level of detail to be able to make this assessment. And so I'm sure you're all finding that there's a lot of laboratory testing going on, a lot of in situ or piezo cone testing going on to get to grips with this. And basically it's saying that if you've got contractive tailings or foundation materials within your facility and it's got the potential for brittle failure, you've got to investigate and do this and get to grips with this properly. Under the same topic and principle requirement 4.7, reads like this, it says the existing tailings facilities shall conform with the requirements of principle four, except for those aspects where the engineer of record with review by the ITRB or a senior independent technical reviewer determines that the upgrade of an existing facility is not viable or cannot be retroactively applied. In this case, the accountable executive shall approve and document the implementation of measures to reduce both the probability and the consequence of tailings facility failure in order to reduce the, the risk to as low as level as possible or reasonably practical, the ALARP principle. The basis and timing for addressing the upgrade of existing tailings facilities shall be risk informed and carried out as soon as reasonably practical. Now, this is a particularly important requirement for us in South Africa here because we have existing tailings facilities that may not meet the requirements, the new requirements, particularly under some of the undrained conditions and particularly for the residual undrained conditions. And then you have to work with the accountable executive, if you're the EOR and vice versa, to say, OK, how do we manage this risk going forward? Does it or doesn't it need a buttress? Can that dam continue or does it need to be stopped? Those are all decisions that are quite fundamental for this industry at this point in time. So when this comes out, it's not just the ICMM companies that are going to be impacted by this. It's going to be all mines, mining companies in South Africa. So this has some potential contentiousness in terms of how this document will be accepted. And um, we believe that this is in the interest of the country to do this right. That comes back to risk management. You know, we obviously required in terms of the GIS to, him to do the failure modes and effects or a bow tie risk assessment. We need critical controls and we're obviously starting to put in place what we call TOPS, the trigger action response plans. And I've listed a few things that could be included there like a freeboard, anything to do with your phreatic level. Is there seepage? Is there movement? And are you monitoring those? and so on. And it's moving in the direction of this real time monitoring and the insurers are starting to ask, where's your online system? It's too slow, your manual system. You've got to do things quicker and better. The technologies out there. So where these minimum factors of safety are not achieved, you're allowed to follow this ALARP approach, the risk and informed approach. But this is not a justification for unsafe existing TSFs, these upstream facilities. The accountable executive and the engineer of record must take accountability for managing this process with the ITRB, the Independent Tailings Review Board Oversight. Got to have action plans in place. Can't just say, oh, we're taking this risk-based approach. There's got to be action plans. You've got to mitigate those risks you're probably going to have to put in much, much more comprehensive monitoring systems to manage that risk and understand are things happening? Could that brittle failure occur? You may have to build buttresses and there definitely needs to be an evacuation plan in place if you've got one of these types of facilities and we have many of those. And I'll put a warning in here about this elastic of what is a lot, what is acceptable, must not be abused. We can't relax as an industry and just say, ah, oh, we're managing our risks. We've got to be careful that we don't stretch that elastic of what we're allowed to do to keep a facility running as long as possible because that elastic eventually will break. So in the document, we've put in a stability uh, check, sort of 
process flow. And this is where the new minimum factors of safety um, come into play. So on the left hand side there, if you follow the, the red arrows down, if you've calculated the drain factor of safety and you comply, you move down and you check that the undrained factor of safety is acceptable relative to 1.3. And then if that complies, you can then look at the post liquefaction factor of safety. And if that all complies, your design and your, your stability is acceptable. If your factor of safety for the drain condition is not acceptable, then you move into, well, you've got to determine the probability of failure. And that then takes you on this different route, and that probability of failure may incorporate a number of different things, such as steep slopes, high rates of rise, what is the phreatic level, and any other conditions that, I, that I've listed there. So that, that's in a very important process is what is the probability? What are the factors that could affect this uh, check? And likewise, if you don't pass the undrained factor of safety condition, you then got to look at the probability of triggering. And so we quite a few of you have probably been doing that already, and you've been applying your tops and saying, you start to move from your green to yellow to your orange. And what are the things that could trigger it? Is it a seismic event? Is it a high rate of rise, a rising phreatic level, or some form of excess pore pressures that are built up that you're picking up in your piezometers? So there's some reaction taking place. And that may may lead to obviously certain actions. Is it urgent action or is it an acceptable um, condition that you can manage? And last but not least, if you don't pass the post liquefaction factor of safety requirement, what's your exposure or risk reduction that's required? And it depends again, are you in a seismically active area? So you've already looked at whether you're likely to, to get seismic events, and then uh, what's the frequency of that? What's your rainfall area look like? Are you in a dry, arid area as opposed to um, a very wet area? And what type of storms do you get? And the, the type of rainfall pattern needs to be looked at, and possibly climate change comes into that as well. So this is, we thought that this would be a helpful sort of process flow to add just to make sure that people do go through the right sequence and that it's clear that it's not just written in words but it's um, in uh, text as well or in, in picture form. Sorry I see there's a, a question here. And that, that's that elastic that I was talking about. So the question was, um, you know, along the lines of what what is acceptable? And so it does need to be a decision made between the engineer record and the accountable executive with review from the, the ITRB to get to that agreement that you're not pushing that boundary and stretching that elastic too far. So it's, it's not clear cut in terms of what's acceptable. It has to be a, 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 not a single decision, but a joint decision. And why does the Senate go as far as that? Is that because it's just too much information? I think that would probably be too prescriptive, um, but it's, let, let's see what, what comes back in terms of comments. That, that may be something to, to keep in mind and make it much more strict. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way it's it's drafted at the moment. So yeah, it's it's an interesting perspective. So I've mentioned in terms of so I'm just starting a new section here in terms of the challenges. Upstream tailings facilities are going to be one of the key challenges we face. There's nothing in the in the new code that says upstream tailings facilities can't be designed. So it's it's it is allowed. But obviously then the onus is on. The industry to make sure that. 
the necessary stability requirements are in place with the whole complexity of the barrier systems that we have to put in underneath the facilities um, with all their low friction properties. So it's just one of those things that it is allowed, but we've got to make sure it's done correctly. In terms of the storm and earthquake recurrence intervals, I've mentioned already the, the challenge we have with the databases being too short. Um, and how do we get that right? So who decides on, on the right values? And that's where I say I think you've got to you know, do your assessment and then go to your client and say, what values do you believe we should use? Do we use something in the middle of that range? Do we use something on the conservative side or, or not? Climate change is included in the document because it's part of the GISTN, just so that uh, it's not something we've excluded, but it's adequately covered without extra um, annotation there. In terms of monitoring, real-time monitoring has arrived, and I think that's now driven by all the consequences of these requirements, and it's 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 just going to be asked for more and more. So that that's that's where this is moving moving us. The courts will also expect this type of thing. So if the technology is out there, we're going to have very little excuse not to use it. What it does mean, though, is that now you need a different set of skills around your tailings facility. You need IT people and your CNI people to link these systems together and to maintain them. If you don't have them as part of your team, just like you need your surveyors and your environmental people as part of the, the, the team, your instruments then fall over, they don't work, and now you haven't got good real-time data, and you can't then make the right decisions from your dashboards and your alert systems, and, and you can't trust those triggers, and then you may get a lot of whole uh, false alarms, and that system is not good. So you need the backup of these resources. So that's that's something that we're going to have to face as an industry. And hopefully we don't get a lot of theft and vandalism of of these types of instruments. I've mentioned the resources. JSTM is demanding a lot more roles and responsibilities to be filled. Um, and there is a lot more work, so we need more people. And I think we're, we're in an industry right now where people are being stimulated and learning a lot on the job. This is, to me, this is a really interesting uh, industry to be in at the moment. Some of that saw mechanics that we sort of thought, oh, it doesn't apply to tailings dams. We're now pushing those boundaries and developing you know, and advancing the science because of the requirements to, to get these facilities safe. So it's an opportunity and a risk for the industry. We've got to train up young people. And um, I'm certainly encouraged by some of the young graduates coming out of university. So I think there's there's hope, but it, it's something that is going to take some time. And we need to have good training in place. Mining companies are going to have to make sure that there's adequate budgets in place. Um, and, and I'm certainly seeing a big change in that regard. And certainly the, my, the, the, the major mining companies are not holding back. They are committed to August 2023 and meeting the deadlines. And they are wanting to make sure that both the ICMM and the other stakeholders like the insurers and investors are supporting them uh, or are acknowledging that they are compliant. There's going to be a lot more audits and reviews, and I think I've mentioned that already. Tailings dam closure. This is something that we haven't done particularly well in the past, and the requirement is that we must develop closure plans to a feasibility level of detail right at the design stage, and then that must be maintained during its life, and obviously to a more detailed level at closure itself. But we have a real problem here is that how will some of our existing tailing facilities be closed? And what does sustainable closure look like? What's the final land use for some of these old gold tailings dams? How are we going to close those? Can we revegetate them? Are those, what are we going to do about those slopes? What about the dust? And these are real challenges. And GISTM is requiring that we get this right. 
and we've got a lot of dormant facilities, let alone active facilities, and this is going to be a challenge. So I, I, I listed it as one of those challenges that uh, we're going to have to work very carefully on, and it has to be done with the communities because ultimately communities are going to have a say in that final land use. So in terms of timing for compliance, I, I just touched on it now. ICM requires that by August 2023, the high, very high and extreme classified tailing facilities must be in compliance. Now, I suspect that we, where, where you've been asked to um, be involved in, in assisting with compliance of these facilities, you're probably going to get very close. But it's one of those things where I think you'll get close and then there'll always be a tail of work that keeps going, keeps going in order to improve that compliance all the time. So yes, there's a deadline, but I suspect that uh, as an industry, we'll be refining that all the time. But if you're largely in compliance by August 2023, I think uh, that'll be good for, not only for the industry, but uh, it'll be recognized by the investors and so on. August 2025 is that for the low and significant TSFs. Um, so there's a little bit more time for that. Obviously, they lower risk. So yeah, I think I've covered pretty much everything on the slide there. And it, there's lots of documentation that has to be put in place. There's various design basis reports, design deviance reports, construction reports, continuation reports, and gap analyses, and so on that makes up all of this. So that's what uh, is consuming a lot of consultants time at the moment. So this is the, the last slide and I'm going to end with with this then is what is the way forward? We believe that for now until this this code is accepted in whatever form and with whatever changes may be required that the old code has been superseded. We've kept whatever content was relevant. If for any reason what we've put together is rejected, what we will do, and we believe this is probably a good approach, is to, under the auspices of SICE and SAIM, still publish this as a good practice document for the industry. So that's a fallback position. We really hope that that doesn't happen um, and and so that's where we're at at the moment we just uh, I can't tell you right now that this is everything and everything's going to go according to plan but if it doesn't I think we will still put this out um, as, as a good practice document obviously the mines and operators are going to have to start preparing for this because for those that haven't adopted this type of approach it's quite a big big change and there's lots to catch up on, lots of documentation and work to be done. The consultants are going to be uh, having to apply, comply with this. Uh, and I, I think generally in the industry, I'm not seeing any consultant who's objecting to what's in the GISTM. In terms of government and industry bodies, we do need them to support us on this. It's in the best, it's the best interests of safety and health. And on that note, I'd like to end this uh, presentation by just saying, let us never forget what happened. We definitely don't want this to happen in South Africa. We need to do things better. And uh, I believe we can. We've got the, the skills, the knowledge, and, and the people to get it right. Um, so I thank you and thanks again to the, the sponsors for their involvement and to, to SICE. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I have any some questions. Andrew, if, we, if you don't mind just repeating the question for the online audience. Do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, so we we've focused mainly on tailings, but it we've included 
um, statements along the lines of you're still going to have to make sure that you know, a gypsum dam or a, a coal stockpile or um, ash dams also go through a process um, of compliance. So there's no doubt that the focus is on tailings, but those others are touched on. <clears throat> Not at this stage, no. That may be a sequel, um, but first let's get the standard out um, and then we can see the demand for it. You know, I'm of the opinion that there's a lot of guidance documents out there and that to add another one, maybe not a lot of value. Okay, so yeah, I agree with that. It's just that so there's some types of topic etiquette, some which sort of change slightly. Like, for example, and probability Yes, I think you're right. Uh, it's it, there's probably some grey areas there, um, and the way we've kind of left it is that that needs to be then decide decided between the client and the consultant, and with with review from the uh, independent review board to make sure that those grey areas are you know covered in in an acceptable way. I think to prescribe it or define it. Better may even not be easily done in a guidance document. Uh, more than that, so yeah. So you said it should be coming up with Yeah, sorry, I, I need to be repeating your questions, and I hope those online can hear the questions. Um, just the question is, um, we're not coming out with a guidance document just yet. Um, Public comment, you said it this month. Yes. Um, Question was: uh, Is public comment um, is the document going to be out for public comment um, at the at the end of the month? That is the plan. Uh, let's see what comments come back from from Sands. Um, their comments close on Sunday. As a, as a... go ahead, Mike. Mike. <laughs> Out of all those very many plans, we've only had very few areas, and most of them, I think, are related to construction difficulties in construction areas. I think you can, you can only think of how many three, four areas over all these years. So why now the upstream dams are getting a bad name? Yes, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I think as a South African fraternity, in terms of we've got used to designing upstream tailings dams, we believe we understand them, but they are more risky. And I think that's where the focus is. is and that's why we've, we've allowed upstream dams to you know, be designed. So we haven't banned them or vetoed them. Um, we're leaving that up to the prerogative of, of the, the client and the engineer to get it right. As you say, our climate lends itself to, you know, with slow rates of rise, you get the desiccation, you get the strength. And, and we just put in there those 10 rules of upstream dams, because then at least you've got a basis for saying, I checked that that wall zone is, is going to work. Um, and, you know, Mr. Operator, we're going to cap that rate of rise because we need that, you know, because if you get high rainfall season, it affects your desiccation and your consolidation um, and your phreatic level. So I think to to not you know give it some level of importance would would be uh, probably not a good thing. Um, but I think we can as an industry still do it properly. It is still cheaper. And that's unfortunately you know going to be what's forced on us more and more. And why we, you know, especially if we're putting it on a liner system, why it makes it all the more difficult to get it right. And lots, lots more under drainage systems and so on to to make sure that the new designs still comply. Yes, I'm testing tailings dams, ash dams, bone mine tailings, etc. And we found that the 
we found that the tennis grounds can be all consolidated over a depth of 20 meters or more, and uh, which you know, is very, very comforting. And uh, therefore, if one were to design in accordance with the normal rules, limiting the rules, uh, limiting the rate of rise, and all the other good things that we need to do, the checks and slope stability and the pen structure, etc., the risk of an upstream tailings dam when engineered in, in accordance with standard practice should be very, very minimal, especially if you consider three or four failures uh, against so many hundreds probably of dams that have been built already. Uh, the risk is relatively small. And of course, if a dam is close to an area where the consequence of failure is huge, then of course, in accordance with present practice, one would still apply very much greater temperature of safety, slower rate of rise, and all those things to make sure that we as professional engineers design safely. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a very, very valid comment. Uh, we're in that era now where what may have been considered safe in the past, we've now got to prove that it's safe. So it's just a lot more onerous and rigorous. Um, and if those tests and and uh, the, the monitoring data confirms it's fine, we, we, we can continue in that, that vein. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Andrew. Um, I just wanted to know if the standard does get approved, are there any timelines for its implementation, similar to like GSTA and is, are there deadlines by when I must comply with this standard? Yeah, to be honest, I, I haven't given that a lot of thought. I think we're probably tied to the GISDM timelines to some extent. Um, but you're right, for those companies that have not you know, been following this process since GISTM came out. Uh, they've got a backlog to catch up, so we're probably going to have to uh, look at a, a similar three year window for those sort of higher risk facilities and a five year window for the others. So, yeah, I, I don't think we've um, got to thinking about that, but that that's a very good point. Uh, we're going to have to give some extra time on, on some of those, yeah. Got one more ID question. Um, if, if this leads so heavily on the GISDM uh, standard, what, what is the motivation behind the, the sense why don't we just comply with the GISDM standard and be done with it? So we did consider, uh, you know, just going straight with GISTM, but there's there's a number of unique South African aspects, um, and some of our laws also require things to be done slightly differently to just saying follow GISTM and some of their um, guidance documents. So we've that's why we felt it was important that we kept a a South African context in there because we do do things differently to what's done in other parts of the world, so we need to address those things. So that's that's the, we did have that discussion, and uh, so it, it, it's a good question, um, but that's our reason. Yes, so country uh, legislation is still something you've got to consider. Andre, do we have any questions from the online attendees? Not at the moment, my side. Um, those that do want to ask questions, um, just put up your hand. We've got one in the comments from Florian, um, who basically asked, who was involved in the update, Andrew? Yeah, sorry, I didn't uh, put names in, in terms of the the people, but they will all be acknowledged in the document when it comes out. Um, so I'm, unless you want me to try and remember 20 names from memory, I, I'd rather just wait for the uh, the names to be in the final document, if you don't mind. 
Um, and then just Florian had one more um, comment where he said, I believe it's not the right way to still hang on to the global safety concept as it is in contrast to the currently accepted partial safety concept regarding the stability assessments. Yeah, I think that's something that's uh, evolving and it's it's coming into the practice. Um, and again, I think uh, we've tried to steer clear of being prescriptive around how you do stability analyses. It's rather um, if, if you are going to use factors of safety, then that's that's a way to do it. But it doesn't mean that you can't do it a different way um, in terms of uh, partial safety factors or different methods of analyses. So those are uh, just different approaches and they can be accepted. So they're not excluded, but we haven't uh, followed that method for now. Andre, if I think that's that, then we might as well, we, we can close. John, if you don't mind handing. Andrew, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. I think it's been exceptionally well put together uh, with uh, GIS, GISTM as well in the South African context. Uh, congratulations to your team and thank you for all your hard work. We look forward to the final version. Um, if you like, when you when it is ready for public comment, you can send it out through our newsletter and uh, inform our members so that nobody misses that. Um, and um, it's very encouraging that the minds are embracing it. So thank you very much. We brought we got you a bottle of red wines, Villa Fuente. Apparently, it's a very good wine. But it's also called seriously old dirt, which, which is what which is what we normally work with. And I think what you've done is you've taken some seriously old rock, turned it into some uh, juvenile dirt. Maybe that's why I keep throwing his toys, and we have the problems we have now. Oh. But thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the the, the final uh, uh, versions of the code. Well, we look forward to opening this when uh, it's. It's finally out, but uh, I certainly need to acknowledge all those who have been part of the subcommittee. Um, I mentioned that there are about 20 names. Uh, the group actually worked pretty quickly. If you think about the fact that we put it together in, in just over a year, um, quite a process when everybody's online and so on. So yeah, thanks to everyone. And I'm sure there was some here that uh, um, got feedback as well. Thank you. OK, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that brings us to the end of tonight's proceedings. Um, please join us for some food and drinks. Um, look out for the next newsletter for the next gen, uh, for the next uh, evening lecture, which would be in September, I, if I remember correctly. But yeah, thank you for attending. Thank you for all who attended online and good evening. <coughs>